ഹായ് ആർക്കും ഹലോ ഹായ് ഹായ് ഗുഡ് മോർണിംഗ് ഗുഡ് മോർണിംഗ് ഹായ് സോണി ഷ്വേതൽ നെറ്റും ഗുഡ് ടു സീ യു ഗൈസ് ബാക്ക് അഗൈൻ ഹായ് ഗുഡ് മോർണിംഗ് ഗുഡ് മോർണിംഗ് ഇൻ ദി മീൻ വൈൽ വി കൻ സ്റ്റാർട്ട് വിത്ത് ഇൻട്രോഡക്ഷൻസ് ഗെറ്റിംഗ് ടു നോ ഈച്ച് അദർ ആൻഡ് സെറ്റിംഗ് ദ മൂഡ് ഫോർ ദ ഡേ um there are a few new people here so i'll start with my introductions i'm ishita shah and uh, i work as a um, i'm trained as an architect and a historian and i work as a curator for culture preservation projects and um, through curating for culture so it's a self funded collective uh, who we are and what we are i think has been under evolution so we'll get to understand and together uh, what curating for culture becomes eventually um and before i tell more about constructing personal archives if i can request whoever is comfortable to keep um their cameras on uh, switched on because then it's less of talking to a black screen or um static icons and making the room more interactive uh, not more so much for me uh, but uh, i think even for our facilitators it will be very comfortable if that can happen uh, so back to constructing personal archives um, it's sort of a home grown initiative that's what i want to call it uh, an incubation program where o- over the two editions we have been able to support different kinds of archiving projects and it becomes a very interesting space which navigates between um academic questions and practice based uh, tools and approaches so that's what keeps us going it's it's very thriving every day we start with a lot of questions we end with new set of questions and um a lot of fermentation happens on the way so that's constructing personal archives uh, you are here for workshop 5 uh, of this edition 2022 23 and the first four workshops uh, we went through proposal building um we worked on uh, uh archive looking for archives and collecting and what are the different sources that one could work with uh, what are the forms of documentation and from there we moved on to talking about very basic uh, technical aspects like metadata mapping and making record sheets and finally fourth workshop we took a sort of a, uh, not a u turn but sort of a diversion and we started talking about writing stories and what does it mean to um look for ima- emotions and values in your archival projects and this was sort of something that would help understand metadata mapping again so that's why i'm calling it a diversion or a u turn and so we are here today now having understood these different aspects of archiving i really don't want us to think of them as a linear process because in practice when we build archives these are all parallel processes um so here we are uh, thinking about how to make these archives digitally accessible um while you could be still working on the other steps but what is the intention and how do you make it into a digital platform so that's the interest for the fifth workshop i'm not re- repeating the schedule because you are all aware of it it was there in the email if anybody has any questions or concerns we have to leave or something you can always drop a message in the chat or drop an email um, i'll be watching over both spaces uh particularly this workshop i have much lesser role to play because this is not a subject which at all i am pro in i have a lot to learn so i'm going to be your moderator more of so um and um, our co here um i'm taking the liberty of calling you by your half name i hope that's okay thank you uh, yeah, and then you. um ram will join us later in the second half and then our presenters tomorrow will take us through more projects um and we'll continuously discuss aspects of digital archiving so that's the larger format and i'm here to build bridges between what your intentions and questions might be and uh, the kind of answers and approaches we can expect from our facilitators with that my introduction is done um uh, again to highlight we are recording which i mentioned in the email also we are still very open to the idea that something you said was not supposed to be said um you can always email us back and we can remove those those minutes and those clips so please don't worry that all of it is recorded and it will go up as it is you can always highlight what you're worried about the reason we record and disseminate if you might go and check our youtube channel because they are becoming online resources for a lot of other folks who cannot join the workshop 
for whatever reason. So we know university professors who are using it to talk to their students when they want to introduce them to the subject. Um, I know some of the old participants who have been falling back onto this data as they're working on their projects. So there are multiple reasons why this resource is becoming important. That's the only reason we want to disseminate it. And we want more people to want to work with archives and archiving projects or frameworks. So logistics done. Um, so we can start with introductions of the participants. And then once Arco is taking over, I'll introduce him in a more formal manner. So should we start with one of the two new participants, Nishita or Sanya, either of you? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I just, this is my first time um, in the space of archiving. So actually, when you were talking, I wish I had attended the first four workshops. Um, I'm not sure if I actually um, would be able to catch up to everything that has been done so far. Um, just a little background. Um, I did my uh, bachelor's in design and uh, master's in interaction design as well. And I did a little bit of data visualization during my master's. So I'm thinking that maybe that's probably related to uh, what we're going to do today. Um, yeah, uh, and the project that I'm currently going to be working on is uh, this uh, collection of photographs of the sky during the pandemic. Um, I'm uh, open to like any feedback on whether that is a good archiving project or if there are other things that uh, I should probably work with. Yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Nishita. Um, yeah, you can always catch up on what's been done. Uh, we can speak about that if you're interested later. Sanya? Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Sanya, and I am a PhD scholar at IIT Delhi. My master's is in English, and I am, I'm just in my first year. I'm still doing my coursework. Um, so I'm working on an Urdu genre called Marcia, which are elegies. And I intend to create a digital archive of Marcia. So this is why I'm here in the workshop. I, I have a little background of um, creating archive. And I work in corpus linguistics and NLP tools. So yeah, that's it. I'm very excited to learn more about archiving. And this is my first time. Thank, Thank you, Sanya. I think we have a lot to learn from you as well. The subjects that you're talking about might have its own tools um to add to the archiving frameworks uh, yes i'm but i'm still a beginner i know very little <laughs> yes we we'll keep in touch <laughs> that's how we think about it yes, for sure for sure all right sony aparna whoever wants to go first yeah hi hi everyone my name is aparna and uh, um so my practice is in archiving of uh, family narratives and uh, finding um, a sort of a, a pedagogical application for lived histories. And that is uh, some progress that I have made uh, since, you know, over the past few workshops with Ishita and Curating for Culture. Um, I've brought out a book called Precious in the past, which I have shared before as well, which uh, has um, uh, which is uh, an anthology of family narratives that have been told by family elders to the younger descendants. And as a form of archiving that, that was brought out in a book, an illustrated book. And the narrative was in the first person from the point of view of the object. So it was also a material memory account. And uh, it was placed in a historical, geographical and cultural context. Um, and it also showed a map, like a migration map of where all the object has been. So that was archiving from the point of view of the object. I was also interested in archiving, uh, you know, narratives from the point of view of oral history, uh, which I think should be documented for future generations. And of late, I've been exploring how that can instill a greater sense of history and understanding of history in classrooms uh, because you know otherwise it's just if it's all text based we're a little removed from it 
But if any part of your family has actually lived through a historical period or has an object that has been a, that is has historical context, it's much easier to observe lessons in the classroom. I find because there is a personal connect to that era. So that is something that is some new progress I have made over since the last uh, workshop. Thank you. I also work at the Srishti Institute of Design in Bangalore, and that explains a little bit of noise in the background because we're shifting campuses. <laughs> and today is open house, so there's a bit of chaos. Nice to meet you Thank all. You. And in fact, we are glad that you're managing both, even though you have somewhere else to be and you're still be able to attend. <laughs> Thank you. Sony? Yeah, hello. Good morning. Um, so I'm Sony Padhwa, and I have been interested in looking at uh, origins and evolution of Sindhi literature in India. A few years ago, I received about 150 odd Sindhi books from someone's private library. The gentleman's name was Parmanand Ghanshamdas, who was a math tutor in Mumbai, but he was also an avid reader of Sindhi literature. His daughters were interested in giving away his books to someone who might know what to do with them. Uh, I kept a handful of these books with me as I found them to be either classics of Sindhi literature or I found them interesting in some you know, other ways, like there were some works of children's literature. So I sent the others to an archiving organization, which is the Sanchi Foundation in Bangalore. This uh, foundation uploaded these books on archive.org and I forgot about them. So last year I presented them, uh, some of them, the books that were left with me as part of an archive for Ishita's exhibition uh, from Kitchen to Kacheri. At that time, my agenda was to talk about books as a personal archive with me and how they resonated with me. Um, you know, especially given the fact that these belong, book belong, these books belong to someone else and someone else had given them to me. But after that exhibition, I thought about making the archive more than a personal thing. So now I've been thinking about giving it a space of its own by preserving it. In the upcoming uh, CPA showcase in May, I look forward to making this archive available to um, fellow Sindhi readers and researchers also, if they are interested. I realized that having them uploaded on archive.org website is not enough in itself. So in the online archive I have in mind, I intend to make the collection annotated so that it makes more sense to the reader. I hope I can present the collection in a framework that shows the making of Sindhi literature in India comprehensible as a story. I also had another idea in mind of collecting readers' notes on Sindhi literature, of creating a sort of oral history of Sindhi literature. So far I've collected two narratives. I had thought of two ways to preserve the memory and history of Sindhi literature in India through digital archives and through personal memories. I think I'll focus on digital archive for now and let's see what happens. Maybe I, with this archive, I'll discover more people who will be willing to share their memories. And um, yeah, one thing at a time. That's it. I think that's that's a group uh, strategy. Uh, the fact that you will pull out the physical archives for people to look at will hopefully lead you to people talking to you about the oral histories as well. Let's hope for that. That has worked in most of other projects, right? A lot of these uh, um, art and architectural, architectural, but more of art and history archives ab abroad. They started doing oral histories only recently. And the fact that they've had the physical collections is what founds them or gives them the grounding. So it should work, hopefully. Over to you, Nijum. Hello, happy new year, everyone. You might have to uh, switch off the sound of your second device. Uh -huh. Sorry. OK, happy new year. So this is Nijum from Dhaka. Uh, lives and works in here, Dhaka. And I started uh, my archiving training with Ishita in 2021 uh, uh, with the digital materials. Now, from the September, I'm working on the physical space in Prito Astras. And from the January, I'm working in Studio Mahbub Lipi. And 
my project here is about archiving Mahbub and Lipi uh, uh, as an their 90s journey uh, before they become an established artist their journey previous this time uh, and uh, uh, by this workshop this fifth edition my ideas are still uh, growing so this is my project and I don't know what will happen in next workshop. Thank you. Yeah, that's the perfect way to describe the feeling. None of us knew what would happen by six months. <laughs> and that's the fun bit of it. However unnerving it is, I know it's unnerving. Shweta? Uh, hello, I'm a designer and uh, a visual artist. I'm also an educator. I teach at design schools and alternative uh, schools of primary education. Um, uh, as a visual artist, I work with uh, mediums like wood, and I also work in with films. Uh, I have been working on this archive, which is of uh, Navratri in Baroda. Uh, I've made a film with it. And uh, my aim is to make an archive, since it's a living culture, it is not something historical. While there's history, it's also, you know, something that's living, thriving, and uh, changing every year. Um, I wish to build an archive which is uh, interactive and kind of um, helps in shaping the change uh, that is inevitable in any folk culture. So uh, that is where I am. I was very, I mean, I was very vague at the beginning of the archiving thing, but as I move, uh, you know, into the fifth workshop, I think I have some clarity on what I want to achieve through this archiving. So this is where I am. Thank you, Shwetal. It was nice that you say that you have arrived at that clarity. <laughs> so I like Which might change again, but <laughs> at this point, this is where I am. Yes, it's it's this every day of status update. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Shishti, do you want to just introduce yourself? Uh, tomorrow would be different, I'm sure. But that you are here. Um, hi everyone, I'm Shishti. Uh, I'm currently based out of Calcutta. I work as a designer most of the time and I usually focus on digital and physical experiences across archives and museums. So I've worked with Ishita for a couple of archives. Uh, I have worked with um, Confitorium Library to create a few archives and museums for them. So that's where I stand. Thank you so much, Ishti. And this has been the exciting part that these workshops is where everyone uh, listens in to each other's sessions. I think that's been a lot of cross pollination there. Um, Gita ji, are you going? Are you able to listen to us? And yes, I have joined Good. just now as usual. The the very technically disabled person in this group. <laughs> Please don't worry about that. I think we all face our own challenges. You just don't realize it. <laughs> yeah, over to you. Uh, morning. Uh, familiar faces with the Shwetal, Nijum, and Soni Wadwa. Nice to uh, connect again. Uh, the last uh, workshop has been really very interesting, and I am uh, Dr. Geeta from Bengaluru. I am the founder trustee of uh, Destination Heritage, which is a seven-year-old organization, and we are into a lot of uh, heritage activities, starting from heritage walks and having MOA with uh, the Christ University, wherein we are uh, having a two-credit course for uh, leadership development through the art of storytelling in modern India. Then we are also going to introduce skill development through the revival of ancient Indian board games and two more in the offing. So I uh, was very much interested. I always feel that uh, there has to be personal history documentation at the micro level. We need not think of uh, making documentation at the state or whatever of some uh, happening, but start right from your home. And uh, with that in mind, I attended uh, the December workshop of uh, curating for culture. It was uh, uh, really gave me some guidelines as to how because I am thinking of making a personal uh, 
uh, documentation of uh, my husband, like I told last time. And with the inputs, I have reached out to people and already I'm thinking of, I don't know, Ishita, I'll have to come back to you as to how many uh, memories should I that I am collecting has to be published in the form of a book. So I have already got now 20 memories and I hope to close by next week because I'll have to shift through. Then I'm also asking for photographs and where there are no photographs, I, I thought I will call an illustrator. And so if the left side of the uh, book has got uh, matter about, uh, I mean, the memory of some person about my husband, the right side will have the appropriate pictures. Or if not, I will get an um, uh, illustrator to do it. It may be in the form of a ca half caricature and half uh, uh, actual uh, type of uh, illustrations. And uh, I, I don't know how it will uh, shape out, how to come. I'll have to take Ishita's uh, help. What exactly is the number of uh, uh, memory that is worth publishing because basically this is going to be a gift to my granddaughter because my husband was very keen uh, to see her birth but it was not to be so instead of me telling in five ten minutes so and so was my grandfather so and so was your uh, so and so so and so i thought this uh, book which may have about 50 60 pages which will be uh, I mean, uh, how people have interacted with him because we are collecting memories. So this will give a comprehensive idea of who this gentleman, her uh, uh, grandfather, Mr. Arvindra Rao was. And maybe there will be some takeaways and live up to the ideals and values he stood for. That is the one thing. Second thing, I would like to send a message stating that, hey, look here, it's very easy to do a personal documentation. You start with your own home. And I think people uh, should at least be interested or enthused. Yes, let's give it a try. So I have started my journey after attending Ishita's uh, last uh, workshop. And I hope that by the time we come from the next uh, workshop, Ishita will have this book in her hand. Wow, that's, a <laughs> that's it. that you have made. Thank you, Gita Ji. Thank and you. and Sanya, this is a good point for me to highlight that this is the variety and the and variety of outcomes or intentions also for archiving projects that one can work with. Uh, that's been one of the biggest um, sort of uh, messages for constructing personal archives that we can work at different scales with different kinds of models of archiving. Um, all these different steps and tools that we have discussed until now, which you can catch up on, um, they they apply, they adapt itself to different kinds of um, situations, and uh, we can we can have different outcomes of an archiving project. This is uh, also coming from a space where one wants to break a notion that archives are only institutions or institution building activities. So that's that's what I mean to highlight. Okay. So with that, we are we're just on time, 10.30 exact. Uh, I think two people who would be joining us in between would be Shinidi and Tonisha. Um, I think through their projects, uh, we might get to know them. And I'll move on to formally introducing Arko. Uh, thank you so much, first of all, for making time on a Saturday uh, to facilitate this workshop. Um, we have been in conversation with Lekha for a while, and finally this workshop and this collaboration is happening. And I think I really want to know what this platform can enable. I think we all need it. So um, Ako is, uh, okay, I'm going to read. Ako is a developer, designer, and an artist. Um, he has a background in computer science engineering and is now pursuing a uh, master's in human-centered design at uh, Shishti Manipal Institute of Art, Design, and Technology. And uh, from what I understood from other team members of uh, Lekha, that it's been a much bigger team uh, in terms of people who have come together. And Ako um, was, uh, research, was a research intern um, at the organization and he has helped with interface design and development of Lekha. I think just the right thing that we want to understand. Um, and Lekha is actually situated as a, as a project under the Indian Sonic Research Organization, which if I'm correct is a lab at Shishti, is that right? It's one of the labs. Yes, it's one of the labs. So one Shishti, labs. It's, it's known as Art Science Bangalore. And um, the ISRO um, sort of is situated at Art Science Bangalore, physically at least. Oh, so, interesting. Yes. So yes, it's this whole nesting of initiatives and projects. Absolutely. And from there, Arcos come on board to take us through this platform. Thank you so much, and over to you. Thank you for that introduction, Ishita, and thank you so much for um, 
having Lekha and me over to sort of this um, this lovely meeting. Um, so right, I mean, there isn't much more to me than what Ishita just spoke about. But I think in general, um, I like tinkering with code, generative art, memes, and anything really that sort of elicits the emotion of joy. I think that's how I'd like to um, describe myself and my practice or uh, wherever or, or, or wherever it has developed so far. And um, so as Ishita mentioned today, um, I'll be talking to you about Lekha, uh, which is essentially an archiving platform that was built for artists by artists. And I was only one cog in the bigger scheme and wheel of things. Uh, but I will um, sort of take you through some of the things that we built and also some of the capabilities that Lekha has to offer in terms of making um, archiving more accessible to the general public and not just for um, professional archivists. Because I'm not an archivist myself. But then while I got, I mean, while I was interning at the um, uh, Indian Sonic Research Organization, I got to meet and speak and work with archivists and see how they go about um, uh, metadata and um, custom descriptors and all of that for the work that they're archiving. Um, so that's something that I hope you take you all through. And um, also, Ashita, do I, I mean, do I like start off um, with Lekha and what it is, the philosophy and all of that, or is there something in between? No, now it's now it's go ahead. However, awesome. you have planned the session. Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so, from a philosophical standpoint, uh, the way we envisioned Lekha was to think of any piece of work that anybody uploads as art, not art in the traditional sense of the word as as a drawing or a sketch or a painting, but art as a um, as a metaphor. And um, so now I guess I will um, start sharing my screen and um, take you through what Lekha is. Just give me a second. So today, um, sort of one of the agendas of this workshop is to also try and uh, take you through creating an actual archive on this platform. And I will do that in just a bit. Uh, but uh, before that, if you were to think of all that's possible on Lekha, apart from just creating your archive, let's say um, you would like to create a very succinct curated version of your bigger archive. That's what we call exhibitions, essentially. And um, so one of our featured exhibitions is that of um, Abu Abraham's Eichmann trial. So Abu Abraham was an um, uh, Indian cartoonist and illustrator. And um, he had um, traveled uh, to the uh, Eichmann trials, uh, which was essentially um, uh, uh, which was on Adolf Eichmann, who was one of the perpetrators of the Holocaust. And so if we were to take a look at, um, at the curated exhibition before sort of um, going to the larger archive, so what this lets you do is um, it draws your attention to very specific events um, that might have happened during this specific trial. But in general, so you curate it so that it's not the entire piece that you're bombarding to an audience out there, uh, but just the specificities of a certain thing that you do. Um, so as you can see, um, you can um, the curation can be such that like, you could have both um, images and videos, and um, you could annotate them, which I think was an interesting um, point that uh, Sony Vadva brought up, which was annotated exhibitions. That's another thing that we are looking to offer on Lekha. So this is one of them. And um, if we were to look at the larger archive, um, you could do that as well, where essentially you have um, sort of like an archivist bio, um, an image of the same, and um, how you would identify yourself. And when we move on to the archive, uh, so essentially, Lekha is broadly divided. I mean, the way Lekha thinks about work or art is in terms of collections and series. So let's say in this case, um, uh, we have 
one broad, uh, two broad collections, the first of them being travel sketches. And now under travel sketches, we have several series, which is uh, uh, from, from Abu in Ukraine uh, to inside um, Russia with a sketchbook and so on and so forth. So essentially you have, um, broadly you have categories and under categories you can have series based on how you want to um, group your work in a logical manner, if you will. And apart from being able to create an, a digital archive uh, and, um, and exhibitions, another thing that Lekha offers is uh, the ability to archive physical objects. So this horse that you see here, uh, this was um, this image was captured at Janapada Loka, which is a folk museum in Karnataka, Bangalore. And uh, but this obviously is two dimensional. But what we did with the help of uh, photogrammetry, which is um, a photographing technique, was to three D scan this object. And so essentially, this is another feature that Lekha offers, which is let's say you have a physical um, object that you would want the people to experience and in three-dimensional space, we could help you 3D capture that object and then put it on an archive uh, for the world to see. Um, so this is um, another capability. And uh, what we've also been recently working on is to um, build out these exhibitions in 3D and also make them accessible on virtual reality headsets. Because um, the whole field of virtual reality, while it's not new, it's gaining quite a bit of ground. And so um, we uh, help you create extremely immersive experiences uh, of the archive that you're building. So as an example, the archive that you'd see, Abu Abraham's archive that you saw in 2D, now if we were to launch a 3D exhibition of it, um, this is what the experience looks like. So essentially, we take you into an actual physical exhibition space and you can navigate it on your computer by looking at all the pieces that are and you can um, also zoom into a certain piece and whatnot so essentially if i was to just um, take you around the entire space this is what it looks like right so these are some of the um, features and capabilities that uh, we at lekha are trying to build and um, right, so I think that sort of covers a brief introduction about Lekha. And perhaps, uh, Ishita, now I guess I could, uh, I could actually take them through building um, an archive and then also have them start creating their own. Uh, do you think that might work out? Yeah, that sounds fine. Um, or, I mean, just the other possibilities, if they have first any responses to what you just shared. Oh, no, absolutely. Yes, please. The platform itself, if they want yes. to understand why something was thought about, or totally. anybody else wants to respond to that, you liked it, whichever. <laughs> Anyone has any responses before we move to building that? Yes. Yeah, I would like to ask Arko. Why did you take that uh, wooden horse from Janapada? What was the purpose? Right. So um, one of our team, so uh, one of our earlier team members, Dhruva, so his grandfather um, had started off uh, the Janapada Loka. He was the founder of the folk museum. Oh, so this okay. was, okay. right. Uh, and uh, thank you for bringing that up so that I sort of give a background on that. And so essentially, uh, this was, um, uh, we'd gone on a day trip to really not just visit but also speak with the people who um who maintain the place and also are archivists of some nature uh, of some kind of nature so then um and while on that day trip we saw several such um artifacts of historical importance of cultural importance and a lot of them were in 3d and um so this was just one of the pieces we managed to capture in the little time that we got to spend there but essentially, that's the story behind the wooden horse. And do you also give the details when you're archiving details of that particular uh, item? Absolutely, we do. Actually, um, I will, I will, sh like when I start uh, taking you through building the archive, I will show you all the metadata descriptors that you can add and how you go about adding all of these 
information so that it's annotated in some sense. Yes, we do offer the ability, and I will take you through it in just a bit. Thank you. Sure. So this uh, horse that you showed at that point, I'm sorry, I had to take a call. So I wanted to know if there was a form of documentation that you organized. So how did you get the 3D? What is the format for documenting it in 3D form? Right. So um, I don't think the document, if I'm not mistaken, the documentation isn't probably public yet. But I mean, we did think of the process. I'll take it to the process now and maybe in the near future, make it available on Lekha so people can go and visit and see. Yeah, so essentially what we did was um, there are apps out there that let you um, capture objects in 3D. So what you do is you take several snaps of the object from all around the object, top, bottom, and all possible views. And then the application stitches this together, stitches all of it together, and creates the 3D form. And what we do is we the way we've built Lekha is for us to be able to showcase these 3D models, because showcasing that is a technical challenge, and we've figured out how to go about doing it. Um, so that, in, in, in brief, is how we go about uh, mapping 3D objects. And even if I can add to what like um, you have just mentioned about archiving in 3D, so there are two ways to actually achieve it. So if you're archiving an object, you are actually, you will be the person who will be moving around the object. When, when you're archiving a space, for example, a room or like an exhibition, you will be at the center and the camera will be moving around the room. So like your camera point will be fixed. And you know, a lot of, uh, like you have softwares even for your phone too. Like the, in, like the tech is very accessible in terms of, uh, you can install it on your smartphone device and like record it. You might not get like exact very high resolution 3D model, but you will be able to capture it to a certain extent. Uh, capturing something like a 3D view for like the easiest way to achieve this is on your Google Pixel because it's already there in the system. They have a 360 degree view, but it's not really photogrammetry. It's still it still gives a sense of archiving in the lowest possible form. So that's what we can still do. Thank you, Shri. And uh, in the digital platforms, these the ones we've seen otherwise, and now uh, what you just showed up. Uh, is it possible to play recordings of films? Because I, what I've seen now is mostly um, static display. Right. So I'm wondering that in kind of a space, can we also generate interactivity of any kind? Uh, right. So uh, if I was to um, sort of tackle the first bit of the question, which was uh, playing recordings, let's say, of um, like files, either audio or audiovisual, um, yes, uh, Lekha does allow you to upload those onto the platform. And um, so the a viewer or a visitor can um, play them. And in terms of interactivity, is that the level of interactivity you're looking at? Or is there something more that you're also envisioning? Yeah, I mean, so one form of archives could be audio video, but let's say um, an artistic interpretation of an archive could also be something to do with AR, VR, or could be to do with um, simulating certain experiences. Um, and we want the person to be able to experience on the digital platform. So if I'm in a space and, you know, projecting something is different, can I do that same thing even in a physical space? Or let's say I touch and something moves down or comes up. You know, that kind of an interactivity where sense of touch is also sort of, but of course, the ear touch through a mouse click. Right. So, no, absolutely. So, what, um, so Abu's archive that I showed you. Hmm. So, right now, that, I mean, in 3D, the, the, the room that you saw, uh, so you were interacting with it through mouse clicks. But yes, further interaction is totally possible um, on Lekha. Uh, but uh, so, right now, we're still building out the feature before we, before we sort of uh, make it available to the general public. But if, um, I mean, if there are requests to build out a 3D archive like the one you just saw with oh. custom um, mouse interactions, that's something that you can get in touch with us. And at this point, we can help you build it out manually. Okay. So you can reach, reach out to us for that. Right. Wonderful. Yes. Anyone else? Any questions or thoughts about? Can I ask? Yes, Sanya. So I recently created a digital archive 
uh, and it is web hosted on GitHub. I attended a workshop like this and um, through a template I created that. But it was um, it was not user friendly, I think, because I am a humanist. I don't have uh, that sort of training in coding and such. So I hope that this is this platform is user friendly for humanists because uh, it was excellent. it was built on uh, a CSV file and it was very difficult for me to edit the the CSV file. <laughs> right. So no, um, fret not because you do not have to deal with CSV files here. It's uh, I mean, so this is a complete um, graphical user interface mm -hmm. where you're not having to deal with files or comma separated variables or code of um, code of any kind. Mm -hmm. And um, I hope it is usable. We'll get to that, and uh, I'd love to hear. What, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how usable your thought Lekha is, and uh, we hope to build on that from there. <laughs> on on that note, we can move to knowing how to build archives. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. sure thing. Okay, I will begin sharing my screen again. I'm just thinking if. Uh, other pe other members here would like to um, sort of follow along. Maybe they could visit lekha.cc simultaneously while they're following this. I'm not sure if that's um, easier for them to do, or do I take them through the whole process and then they can do it on their own time? So because the fine? Google Meet works from Chrome directly, right? So I have a feeling that switching tabs might right. be a task in itself. Uh, no, absolutely. I think in a, in in the in the longer terms, a longer sense, it helps to know the basic steps to be yes. able to repeat them. Uh, so both yes. the logic, um, which will, which could also then, when they try out steps, could also become the coffee break or a break from screen time, or just listen right. time, whichever way you want to put it. Sure. OK. So in that case, maybe yeah, I'll just get started, yes. and um, we'll take it from there. OK. Um, so to start building an archive in Lekha, you get started. and um, so I'll, I'll take you through a brand new archive that I'm making. Uh, so you start off by uh, entering your email. Um, you give yourself a username. Also, please note um, that the username only takes in alphanumeric characters and a hyphen. No other special characters are supported at this point. And uh, I will. Myself a password and after I begin to sign up, uh, right? I think another thing that I missed out on was um, Lekha is open to both individual artists and institutions, which will be a collection of several artists and archivists uh, to be able to create um, an archive. So, for, for the purposes of this demo, we will move ahead with the artist. So now um, you begin by um, being asked to upload a profile picture and your name. So let's go ahead and uh, do that. And then, as I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, you have an, you have the option to express who you are in three words that gets showed up that gets shown on your um on the landing portion of your archive so i'm a designer developer and artist you could um add a biography as well i will just leave that for now moving on mm. Uh, this is optional, but you could go ahead and add links to social media if you so choose. And um, another thing that Lekha offers at this point is the ability to make your ar archives either public or private. Let's say you only wish to create uh, a digital dump of your work at this point and not really show it to the world, because maybe it's a work in progress and you're not comfortable with showing it to everybody. So then um, you have the option to market as private. Uh, for the purposes of this demonstration, we will keep this public. And once, uh, and so that sort of concludes the onboarding process. Um, 
where we take uh, where we just capture some very basic information and then bring you to the dashboard. And this is this space essentially is where uh, you go about populating uh, all the work that you want to. So now, as I mentioned, we have categories and series. So the way you start uploading work is to have it belong to a category. So um, for example, maybe um, for the purposes of this demo, we'll say my first category is uh, that of posters. And um, my second category could be generative art. So I begin by adding these two categories. And now um, I can start adding work to posters. So work is essentially the metaphorical art that um, I was talking about a while ago. And um, so when you go to upload the work, before you add the files, um, these are some basic information and basic metadata that we're trying to collect from you. So since we're doing posters, OK, wait, let me see what I'm trying to add. So I need to click here. And then that brings up um, the file explorer on your computer. Since it's posters, maybe I can start off with this. And if you notice, the bar on top essentially is the loading bar. And once that gets one, once that's complete, you'll know that your um, piece has been uploaded. And now that it has been uploaded, I need to add it to the archive. So I click on this button. And uh, it does take a while for it to show up. And since uh, we're on the topic of adding files, I'd like to sort of take you through some of the accepted file formats is the, at this point. Um, the JPEGs, uh, PNGs, uh, and images for the web format, which is uh, .webp. And um, video is supported, audio, and so MP3, MP4. Uh, and all of that is supported, and also OGG, which I believe is another audio format. So these are some of the accepted formats so far. But we do hope to um, extend that to GIFs and PPTs and uh, a bunch of other formats that exist out there. And let's say um, that is all I have to add in terms of files. So now let me title this as poster one for the lack of a better name. Uh, I think this was from, I don't know, 2020, I think. Medium of art uh, was, uh, it was, it was made digitally on Figma. Um, uh, art author would be also uh, another thing that I would like to uh, bring your attention to is the um, difference between author and creator of the record. In this case, it is me who created it. So um, both uh, the creator and the author are the same people. But let's say you're archiving somebody else's work uh, with their permission, of course. So in that case, uh, if you're the one archiving, you have your name here. But whoever was the creator of the piece, their name comes in here. So there is a clear distinction. Um, uh, that we're trying to make. And classification, um, let's say it's a digital poster. It was created in Bengaluru. And at this point, I don't have an external link to it. But let's say uh, you would like to sort of take the conversation away from here um, to your website, where you have uh, additional content, perhaps um, you could do you could do so. And another feature that we offer is um, uh, to add custom descriptors. So what? So these, uh, all of these metadata, metadata that you see, these are descriptors of some sense because they are adding to the description of the field. And um, let's say this was actually no, I can show you this. Uh, we will get back to this in just a bit. Um, so this is an archive of the Indian Sonic Research Organization, and so they have a bunch of posters that they built. And these were for events, of course. So now, if we want to go take a look at it, um, apart from just knowing when it was created, um, you, you can also add in a custom descriptor of when the event was. right? So how do you go about adding the date of event? For example, you would do that by clicking on Add Custom Descriptor. 
and you would name your custom descriptor here, which was date of the event. It doesn't necessarily apply to the piece I'm uploading right now, but let's say it did. So date of the event could be um, 2nd Jan 2020. And so that's how you go about adding them. And you can add as many custom descriptors as you like. And so in, so in that sense, from a design standpoint, we're not, we're trying not to overwhelm you with too many predefined custom descriptors, but just the absolute ne absolutely necessary ones. And beyond that, um, if you so need and want, you can go ahead and add your own. Uh, so I think that's sort of um, covers adding all the description for this work. And now let's hit on, let's click save and upload. And what you'll notice is um, that your work gets added to your dashboard. Now, this isn't what the what a visitor would see when they want to visit your archive. To see what that would look like, you click on this button, which is go to archive. And once you do that, this is the public view um, of the archive. So this was the image that you would uploaded in the beginning. That's your name. Uh, these are some of the uh, some of those three words describing who you are. And when you click on see the archive, it takes you to the work that you've uploaded. So far, it's only been um, this work called poster one under the category of posters. And now, if you'd like to um, go back to adding more work, you just click on go to dashboard. And um, I'd added um, another category called generative art. So let's add a work to that. Um, And when we do that, we again go and choose a file that we'd like to upload. So in this case, I'll be uploading an MP4 file, which is essentially a video file. And we would give it a moment to upload. Marco, is there a um, sort of limit on the file size that you can upload? At this point, there is. I think we limit it at about 10 MB. Oh. Um, I think, yeah, but right, that is only because um, we're still in development and uh, we are still figuring out the best way to um, work with storage. And um, so we're limiting at 10 MB of file, I think. But going forward, we would we look to uh, increase that because we realize that 10 MB is not as much. Uh, but yes, so far there is a limit. And also you could add a caption to your file. So let's say, this is a screen grab. Um, what's that word? It's the screen grab of a piece of generative art code. Oh, we have a limit on the captions too. So we will leave it at that. And now let's add the uploaded file you are able to preview um, the file after you've uploaded it. And um, just for the sake of this demo, we will call it generative art one. This was in 2023. Medium of work was uh, digital code, description of the work. Um, Um, right, so again, that's me, that's me. Uh, that's a different. Um, right, you hit save and upload, and you wait for the piece to show up. And now, if we were to go back to the archive, see the archive, and click on this piece. Um, so this was the custom description. 
I mean, the caption that we had added for this file. Um, this is a description that we added. Uh, this is the medium, date of um, creation, uh, year of creation, uh, the author, and this is who uh, this piece was archived by. In this case, it's me, but it could be somebody else if that's the case. And here, another thing that I um, haven't mentioned yet is that uh, Leka generates a citation for every piece of work that you upload. So essentially, if there's somebody else or you yourself who is who, who's who wants to cite a certain piece of work on Leka, you do that by coming to this part of the uh, to this part of the work and uh, copying the citation. And um, uh, that sort of um, that sort of covers how you go about creating an archive. So no no code, no CSV, no complex files. It's just your work, the metadata that you'd like to add with complete freedom on how many descriptors you'd like, and um, and the public-facing um, archive. So all you have to do is go to the URL bar and copy this link and share it with whosoever you'd like for them to come and view your work and archive on Baker. Uh So I think uh, that sort of covers what I had in mind from a demo standpoint. And now I'm just excited to um, see what you all build. And also, if, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them now. So I think I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm unable to hear you. I don't know if it's fine. That, that we selected. Sorry, can you come again, please? I was just saying, um, does, it, does, what, does anything change when you change individual over institution? Uh, so one of the things, yes. So let's let's take um, the Indian Sonic Research Organizations. Oh, my bad. Let's take that. Um, I think that archive. So this is an institutional archive, as is uh, as you can notice from the URL. And one of the changes is um, the organization could have its logo here and um, and a piece. Uh, and a piece that describes that organization, perhaps. So these two could be separate images. So these are one of the more breaking changes, not breaking, as in different changes, as opposed to an artist archive. Uh, apart from that, there are there aren't too many um, changes as such. And in the future, uh, we are looking to. So since it's an institution, there could be several people handling the archive of that institution, not just one archivist. And so in that case, uh, we would like to offer um, the ability to create several archive profiles under a certain institution. Right now, it's just one, one archivist per institution. Uh, but then eventually, we'd like to have several of them uh, being able to contribute to one institution archive. OK. So the reason it came up in my mind was also to understand um, does it get tougher if we have too many objects? Because as much as really appreciate that it's so easy to add all the metadata fields, um, I'm also wary of the fact that if one has to work with uh, 100 posters, 100 generative art, 100 music clips, because that's when it starts really becoming an archive when you're building, you're working with volumes of material which you have sifted through. Absolutely. I mean, I'm just trying to draw conceptually a difference between a portfolio and an archive, if I might call it so right now. Um, and there, there is a merit in two things. One, the volume, because then you are you're introducing a load of evidences. Um, and second, that that evidence can connect with another evidence. So something Absolutely. that's common between the posters and the generative art, it should right. happen through my keyword or certain kinds of metadata. So right, absolutely. do these two points get addressed in the platform at any point? Uh, so at this moment, not yet. We've been thinking about these, uh, but we're still going about building them. Also, another point to note, so we had started off this project on a, um, a no-code website builder called Bubble. But now, um, as Ishita rightly mentioned, when volume comes into play, uh, one, one feature that we've been um, one feature request that we've been getting from users is the ability to bulk upload pieces. That's something that uh, we currently don't support yet, 
but we are in the process of making it work. So hopefully in the very near future, uh, dealing with volume shouldn't be uh, much of a problem. And cross-pollination in terms of, not cross-pollination, sorry. Uh, but mapping. I get it, the links. Yeah, the links between different kinds of items. Right. So at this point, it's not automatic, but it's uh, it's a very manual thing. But uh, again, another thing that we're looking to build is the search through tags, right? So you can add tags to every work so that, let's say, uh, you had a tag called poster, another tag called digital. So when you click on that tag, all works that are tagged under that specific keyword show up. That's another thing that's in the works. So right now, when you say manually, it's possible. Um, what could we so what do? I, working what with? I mean is um, you could add those tags to the to your descriptions. But oh. there's no way to sift through those tags yet in terms of having a button on your um, on the interface which says sort. That's something we're still working on and is not available to the public yet. But these are all great points you bring up because um, uh, it just helps us prioritize uh, some of the features in terms of what the users want. So I'm okay. glad you bring these up. Shweta, go ahead. Yeah, so about the tag thing only. Uh, so you are saying I can't do uh, a search for a tag and then find a whole list. Uh, I, I will yes, only right. see that tag in every uh, every bunch that you have and i'll have to go through them to figure out if that tag is available right now at yes at this point in time uh, that's how you have to go about it uh, mm -hmm. but in, we're still we're working on the feature where it becomes it's a search so you search mm -hmm. through the entire archive for a specific tag mm -hmm. and um, you get to see all the work there is but you've said that it's accessible on uh, like uh, the you know from google you can find these archives if they are public right so you think that if i do a google search for the tag mm -hmm. all these might show up i mean i'm just wondering right. without thinking so, right no so i think uh, that boils down to how well we do our search engine optimization for lekha so when you're when you're searching for something on google oh. uh, google needs to know that lekha exists and although and it needs to sort of crawl through all the work there is on the website Okay. So um, while we work on getting our SEO <laughs> a lot better than it currently is, mm. I think um, it is possible for you to uh, go ahead and search for those tags and also mention Lekha in your search query and hope that SEO does its magic and shows you all the pieces mm. that you need to see. Okay. Also, one more thing, like suppose one starts with a um, personal app, but not a, uh, but like an individual. Okay. Yes. Yes. And then wants to move into becoming institutional. Is that possible or not really? Or once you start as an individual, you stay as an individual. So um, manually, as in if you raise a request with us, huh. uh, we can help you migrate from okay. our end. So, okay. but through the user interface right now, that's not a thing that's possible. Okay. But you can raise a request with us if you if you want to. And oh. on the back end, we will migrate your artist um, archive uh, into an institutional archive and okay. vice versa. Although the although institution to individual, I don't know, I maybe that doesn't make as much logical sense as the other way around, where you're expanding from an individual to the to um, an institution. Uh, that that is something that we can help you out with on a manual basis, okay. one on one basis. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. How much will this app cost? So at this point, um, we are not charging anybody any amount of money to make their um, archive with us. Uh, but if we were to, not if, if and when is, is a better way to go about it, uh, we were to um, charge maybe a subscription fee. I'm not sure. We've been trying to calculate, but uh, no number is still available for the public. And that is another reason why we're moving away from, as I mentioned, Bubble, because Bubble as a platform has its own charges. And then buying storage on the cloud has its charges. So we're trying to do away with the charges and the um, constraints of Bubble by building our own version in code. Basically, uh, we're writing this uh, app in Python. So what you're interacting with now, if you visit lekha.cc, is the Bubble version. 
but eventually uh, we, we will migrate. And from a user experience standpoint, nothing really changes. You won't feel a difference, apart from the fact that it will be a little quicker than it currently is. Um, but yeah, it's it's hard to put a put a cap on the cost. Um, but that is not something that our user should worry about at this point, only because it's totally free to use. So we have Tonisha, Nishita, and then Shwetal will come back to you. Go ahead, Tonisha. You're on mute. Hi. Uh I'm so sorry that I missed the beginning. I was internet connectivity is an issue where I am. Uh, can we host video rooms on Lekha right now? I'm sorry. Can you come again, please? Uh, video rooms, uh, books with let's say multiple editions, everything visible at the same time, or so, you know. Right. So uh, we do offer the ability to upload PDFs. So let's okay. say your books are in the form of PDFs. So sure, you could upload them and you could, um, in your custom descriptors, or let's say in the description of your work, you mention which edition it is. And if you would like to link the user to a more updated, re revised edition, you could do so as well by adding in a link to the uh, to the newer version in your description. So in that sense, uh, adding books as PDFs is something that we currently offer and support. Um, eventually, if we want to open, let's say, we want to host it through the cross pollination that was mentioned. Let's say one page where we can show the differences or the changes across editions or versions. Right. Is that something that that's no, absolutely. That's actually a very interesting point you bring up. So essentially, also maintaining a change log in some sense. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. I think that's a term. Oh no, absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up, and. Um, no, we will. Uh, we've taken a note of it, and we should. We'd like love to work on it. Thank you. That's it. Mm -hmm. Nishita, hi. Um, is it possible to upload images as a set or as a series of images that kind of transition from A to B? So at this point, you can upload C. So let's say that I think uh, this is with respect to your the photos of the skies right as you had mentioned yes right. so right so you can create a series on lekha and then upload each of those individual either you could upload each of the each image as an individual work or you could add all the images as part of one work so where you keep uploading mm -hmm. several media so right. you could think of series in both ways in that sense that sounds good thanks okay I didn't understand the second question that Tonisha asked. Can you explain it again? I mean, what did Tonisha ask? I didn't understand that. Um, so, uh, Shweta, sometimes when a video room is basically an online version of a of the full range of an author's work or everything that somebody has produced, right? So there are multiple editions at work at times. Often video rooms are hosted in such a way, instead of looking at the minute changes across the different PDF files, you can look at a single page where the text is there. And you know, either you highlight with color or you create certain sublinks on the text itself so that you can see what changes have been made across time or editions without having to read minutely through multiple PDFs. So you're not just archiving it, you're also making the shift or change in information more accessible for anybody who's looking at that work, basically. So that's it's a <laughs> when we look at giant data files of basically PDF books and things, a video room comes in very handy. So uh, if you're interested, you can look for there is the Canterbury project that's going on. You can just Google it. And that's a very good example of what they are trying to do with multiple. Oh, but I didn't understand what were you trying to find out from Lekha? Like what what can Lekha do in that or not do in that? Like but basically, can they help create a video room? So let's okay. say I have yeah, that it's Got all it. available on the same page instead of just okay. uploading it as separate PDF files. Okay. 
Oh, that's true. I think the recurring theme, uh, at least the conversation between this group, is about multiple uh, entries together. Whether we stitch it as a series of images or whether we put it together as a book. Um, and I could imagine um, in Shwetal's case or in Nijum's case, different kinds of objects would, which would fall under the same collection. Um, in that situation, I think this bulk, uh, not bulk necessarily, but also group upload would be very useful. Right. No, absolutely. Uh, we've gotten this feedback uh, before as well, and it's something that we have act we would like to be working on, only because it makes it all the more easier, yeah. and not just easier but quicker. Let's say to mm -hmm. sort of go about um, adding volumes of work. So, absolutely fair point. And at that point, I also wanted to clarify, or rather, add to everyone's thinking is while we saw in the demo that the categories could be by type of archives. I just want to bring us back to, it could also be by the content. Um, but I think that's right now the beauty of the platform, that if somebody is looking at, um, let's say I'm looking at personal history of a certain architect, and I want to say one category is early age archives, and then I want to make categories of their childhood and education, and then I want to make a category of um, their married life, and, and then getting into practice. So what I'm imagining here is that that entire group which could be a mix of photographs, videos, letters, documents, could become a category of itself. Yes. Is that right, right? So, yes, that's that that's the that's the right way of thinking about it um, from the Lekha standpoint. So yes. you create categories, and categories within categories is what we are calling series. So okay. that's an that's an additional level of grouping that we offer currently. Can you show us that? Because I don't think yes. you know how we could make a sub-series or Right, 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 absolutely. Um, let me... So now if the category was early age and we want to show 1930s and we want to show 1940s, they'll become two series, basically. Right, so I will show you the series architecture. Fantastic. Um, yeah, just give me a second. Oh, wait, I believe I've stopped sharing my screen, no? Yes, you have. Okay, I'll, I'll reshare. Great, great question, Shwetal. Um, so the partial archive, partial um, uh, public isn't available yet. <laughs> They're all in the works, but OK, I guess it's time to push those out with priority. Thank you for asking the question, though. Uh, let me share my screen. I think the other way to put this question would be draft and published, right? So whatever remains saved as draft remains inside. Draft and published as two buttons which would just solve the problem. Absolutely. That's another way to think about it. Sure thing. Uh, I'm just making a note. One second. Uh... Sanya, you can also just pose your question while we are moving to screen share. So we all can think. I mean, Akko can respond as well. So I wanted to ask if I can upload text files because I work on Urdu text and um, I intend to trace the semantic evolution. Right. So my work is really in text and uh, I all I see is the examples of um, PDF files, images. So can we also upload text files? Right. So uh, when you say text files, essentially they're files with the extension .txt, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I believe that like as of this moment, uh, if we could request you to convert the .txts to, the, to a .pdf and then upload it, um, okay. I, 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 I believe that's, that's, that's extra work on your part. I totally understand. <laughs> but I think at this point, um, text in the form of a PDF, <laughs> is something that's uh, actively supported. OK, OK. Yes. Um, right, and before we move on to more questions, I think um, this this archive, which is of Abu Abraham's again, uh, sort of takes uh, makes that whole distinction of categories within categories, which is essentially series. So now, visually, in, in the interface, uh, a series is encapsulated within um, within this sort of grayed out box. 
So one of the series here is Abu in Ukraine. Another series is Inside Russia with a Sketchbook. And um, so these two series fall under the category of travel sketches. So there is a larger category of travel sketch. And then within that, there are two more categories or series, as we like to call it. And um, this is how they're visually differentiated. Um, does that sort of, um, is it in the direction of answering your question, Ishita? Do you think? Yes. I mean, only thing is at the back end, um, when we were entering the data, when do where do we select this or where do we create this? Good point, good point, good point. Yes. Um, mm, okay. Huh. Let me go to my dashboard. So here you notice there's an add series button. So within your category. Uh, another mm -hmm. point, since we're here, so you can add a series of work within category, or you could have individual work in your category, or you could have a combination of both, of course. Now, let's add a series here. So first, we name our series. I don't, okay, let's, if you were to group it by year, let's say. Hmm. So um, let's say 2023, maybe. And um, you add series. So now, within your category posters, you have, um, a series called 2023. And if I was looking to um, move my work from as an individual work to under series. Uh, nice. Yes. So that, that's what you have to do. You drag and drop it into your series, and it gets added to uh, the mm. series of 2023. And then you can go on to adding more work. And when you click on add work, it's the same process of uh, basic information the file or files itself and uh, the metadata fantastic i think the dragging um, i reacted to it saying nice is because especially when uh, most of us are thinking of archiving projects at very early on stage information architecture is something which usually keeps changing or it right. evolves that's the other way to yeah. put it so the tree right. structure, uh, most of them who have practiced it, they right now know that the tree structure might work uh, in a certain way. But they might want to change it. And eventually, the, the name of the series and the category might evolve or change. Absolutely. So means the entry which has been done for a few archival items doesn't have to be redone. It just no. has to be shifted into the right substructure once it finalizes. Absolutely. And if you'd like to edit your series name, or for that matter, edit your work. So we have edit buttons at every stage. And when you do that, you can also change the category it's in. So I could move it to generative art. And I could change the name if I so want. And when I hit confirm, the series just moved from posters to generative art. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. OK. And right. in this, uh, when it comes to the metadata, is the entry going to get saved? So which means if the author is Abu Ibrahim, and uh, do I need to keep adding it, or will it come up as a suggestion or a memory? Um... Right. So um, those automatic um, categorizations, uh, those are something that is not available yet. So you would have to man manually enter the name of mm -hmm. the author mm -hmm. at this point. Uh, but that is another feature that is um, that would save us a lot. That would save an archivist a lot of time. Yes. So that's something to look out for. Okay. Yes. So I think Shwetal has a question in the chat, and then Tonisha has raised her hand. Mm. What is the cap? What is the cap on the size of the archive so far? Uh, I believe we let you upload work worth about fifty to hundred MB in size. I think at this point, but then again, if you if you feel that that's too less, and you would like us to increase the cap on it, please get in touch with us. And it can be done on a one on one level for, for a specific archive, if you so wish to. And uh, this is where I would just interject, because uh, I was very curious, where is it getting uploaded? So in terms of safety of the data and the rights of the data? Right, absolutely. So right now, um, we're using Amazon Web Services, AWS, to store these um, images on the cloud so as to make them available from any device that you're logged into with your account. And uh, from a safety standpoint, with respect to both Bubble and Amazon, um, 
these are industry level um, safety protocols that are currently being implemented. It's not something that we are trying to do on our own, but by using the tools that we are using for the various aspects, uh, these are all industry standard tools with industry standard encryption in place. So safety um, is not uh, is not something we ideally need to be concerned about with Lekha at this point. Okay. Polisha, over to you. Uh, another question about uh, sharing the archive, basically the, the public facing storytelling aspect of uh, Would it be possible to host on Lekha something like, let's say, if my archive is about a space, let's say a bazaar, and I hmm. can either upload an image or create an image with short hyperlinks sort of embedded there, or like some way of when I'm telling the story, would that be something that I can do on Likha? OK, to maybe sort of uh, ask a clarifying question. So I use. Uh, is it so? Are you saying that let's say, I mean, with the whole storytelling aspect, um, you want a link that specifically takes you to that one, like one piece of work? Is that what you're saying, or did I not get that correct? Uh, not that. I'm sorry. Uh, so let's say um, my page, the page that opens when one clicks on one particular link, is that of an image, and there are different kinds of stories. Let's say I'm I'm looking at a bazaar scene, and you know each shop has a particular story that I want people to know, or each object within that picture has, and I want to embed those in textual form and something basically one way or the other in which the user can click on that object and go to that story, or like another page opens or a tiny bubble opens, something like that. Would that right. be something that's possible? So, uh, uh from right so from what's currently available let's say uh, so i totally get the point about being able to, okay so if i'm understanding correctly let's say mm -hmm. um this is an image of a bazaar right yeah and yes. um, there are several stores that are present in the image so you yes. want the ability to um sort of have pop-ups show up against every yes. store on this one image which are hyperlinked to their own page and story Yes, yes, something like okay. that. Right. So the pop-ups are not currently available, but what you could do is embed your links um, either in the description when you're adding them, or you could have uh, more custom descriptors um, where, let's say, one of the descriptors could be shop one, and you could have you could link them here. Shop two, then you can add a link here. So right now, what you could the the way of way to go about it is through custom descriptors only. But again, great, great points. Fantastic. Thank you for bringing them up. I also had a question about how making an archive would extend into curating an exhibition. So the multi-purposeness of the platform. But I also know that it'd be nice we can take this up after a few archives were built or made or tried out. So right. I'm just keeping it out there. So no, Abu Abram's case does the how does the data get pulled into making an exhibition? So maybe we so can take that up later. Okay. So I mean, as I mentioned earlier, so that that part is something that we are um doing on the back end ourselves now. So if someone in this cohort or anybody else who comes across Lekha. If they are willing to curate a specific archive, uh, they could come. They could just contact us, and we will help them create their own curated version of an archive. Okay. Uh, into an exhibition, but that I mean, from the interface to be able to do it from the interface is something that um, is still in the works. Oh, okay. So it's not uh, happening from the handle of login itself. It's happening right yet. now. With okay. We are figuring it out right now by ourselves at the back end. But once it's a public facing um, feature slash button on the interface, it's something that, so essentially you, so the concept here is you pull from your archive to make a very curated selection for an exhibition. So even on the back end, that's a concept, but as a, uh, as a public facing feature, that's something uh, that is not available yet. So oh. yes, that's where we're at. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, then it's our trust. <laughs> right. Anyone else? Any thoughts? Okay, May I think I? I, uh, yes, Tanisha, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Orko. May I call you Orko? Oh, yes, you may. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> This is a very big help for people like us because, um, you know, one hears of Mukurtu and other sites which help with archiving, but even there, the amount of coding that one is expected to know <laughs> sort of defeats a lot of us. So right. aside from something like a blog, having access to something like this that is more, um, that is working with archives rather than just a blog. Right. Template is mm -hmm. a huge help. So thank you for sharing your work. I'm I'm glad uh, that it it possesses the power to make an impact. But I'm I'm I'd be I mean it'll be very helpful to know how you go about building your archive. And I mean some of the points that you've already brought up are fantastic. But if there's more that you come up with while you're engaging with the platform, that'll be great too. But thank you. The pleasure. Uh, another question that came on the back of that multilinguality. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. If let's say um, my work is on the Shundarbon area, so we are looking at a lot of local dialects and making them accessible in English, being able to sort of show how there can be different versions of the same story. So if I again within something like a variorum want to host something like that that you go to this one page and instead of clicking on a number of links with translations and other things you can host it you can sort of have it all available on a single page uh, right. can we do that in some way right so um if you notice that when you're okay let's say you're creating um one piece of work instead of adding like let's say one audio file for example you could add yeah. maybe an audio file and a translation of that audio file either in text or as another audio file in the same work mm -hmm. so it's all available in the same place it's not separate links so you can add multiple media to one work yes so yeah oh, that good. is possible okay. at this time yes mm -hmm. so no right. going from no jumping from one link to another for the um, sort of same piece of work or same transcription or what have you. Um, instead, you upload multiple. So everything that you think connects to that one piece of work, you upload them as um, several media on that same work. So that whole oh. thing about uploading media. So yes, you can do that. That's currently um, supported. Great. Another uh, question, I mean, this is more just for knowledge because I'm presuming because that over these many months that Lake has been out and so many workshops, few more archives would have got built um, mm -hmm. or even Abu Abraham, the archive itself. Why doesn't that come up on the home page? So what does Lekha do to promote the different archives that are getting built on its platform? No, absolutely. So more like a more like a place where you can search for and not just search for but explore everything there is yes fair point that has been on the list it just hasn't been pushed up the priority order perhaps uh, we will get that out yeah because that diversity would have also helped i'm Absolutely. just going to right now look through the platform uh to address you know the different kinds of projects that are there in the group so one could say oh tonisha look at this one it's very similar to what you are trying to do or shwetan so it would Absolutely. be useful to know who all are building and what all yeah. kinds of archives are getting built there no totally very very fair point um we will push that out okay. uh, where it's essentially like an explore slash search page mm. and you just ev everything that everybody is working on is there for you to go and uh, navigate through okay yeah. Thank you. Right. I think this is a good time to take a break uh, from the screen for a bit, of course, um, and come back to the screen and build your own archives. Um, how long do you suggest, uh, Arko, we could uh, take a break for? So, um, I don't know. I think it, um, I mean, I don't know. How much is everybody comfortable with? Five, 10 minutes? 
does that work or longer or ha, so or like the the bio break can be 10 minutes and uh -huh. uh, and then yes i think people could be everyone could be here uh, building your archives and talking to each other and Aku and me in terms of questions that come up in your mind. So if we can try and recreate the actual workshop space, so if we were in the same room, we would have been cracking jokes, uh, we would have been uh, telling each other things. Uh, if we can recreate that space, it would be fun to make these archives together. That'd be great. Does that work for everyone? So we could be back at 11.15. And then let's say up till 1215 or 1220. So that after that, each one of us can show what we built and the questions it raised and then have a group con with conversation. So we're still within time. We'll have 40 minutes for that kind of sharing session. 1220 if we call it a pause. Okay. Thanks, Nishita, for the thumbs up. Um, when you're thinking about building your archives, I'm going to insist and request whichever way you want to put it to try and use all features. So which means a bio of your archive, don't worry about its completeness. Don't worry about um, the English or the, the linguistic aspect of it. Similarly, if you have thought about categories and sub series inside it, try and build those. Um, even if it just has one image and something has two documents and you're not sure if you can still put it there, we can keep these as uh, private links if you're too worried. You can also remove everything after this session. So that's also one of the ways to think about this trial session. But if you can make something more voluminous in terms of showing each other what your archives look like, um, and we can all see the public end of it rather than seeing uh, the back end of it, I think uh, that will give us a lot of sense of what this platform can do for us or not do for us. So you can imagine you're really testing out this platform for us to say, OK, for the next two months uh, towards the showcase of the program uh, can we who all can engage with Lekha and who all might not be able to depending on your project requirements does that sound like a plan few more hands okay is anything because i don't want it to only come from my head that would be very sad that will great so let's come back at 11 50 we can keep the link on and our computers on and uh, we start working 11.50 onwards. OK, so I don't think we really have to walk anyone through. If we can all start working on lekha.cc, um, in case anybody needs the link again, I'm going to put it in the chat. And uh, if anyone has questions while you are uploading or doing, um, deciding certain decision categories or aspects about your archives, then um, you can ask us. We are here. So I think I'll just post Abu's archive as well. Only mm -hmm. if people are looking for inspiration to sort of make their series and categories. Oh, yes, that would be helpful, definitely. Right. Uh, I've just pasted the link in the chat. And if anybody wants to take inspiration, or just take a look at how some of the metadata fields are populated, uh, mm -hmm. they may do so. And in the break, I, I think I just I was reminded uh, about another question related to Sanya's question. Whether we upload a doc or a, I mean, a DOC or a PDF, um, does the archive or eventually will it be working on OCR, um, the recognition? Yes, it will. Okay. So conceptually, Ako, what would be uh, a deciding factor uh, when it comes to choosing between artist and institution? Uh, conceptually, so I mean, so for an individual artist or for an individual person who doesn't want to be associated with any institution or there is no need to be associated to an institution, they obviously go for the artist route. And let's say, like, for example, it was the Indian Sonic Research Organization, um, where whatever we are displaying, um, it also, it, it essentially has works that belong to several different artists and not just a single artist, let's say. So in that sense, when you when you um, decide to showcase all of that work as being a part of a larger group, that's when you think about going the institution route. Okay. Yeah. Conceptually. Um, um, from my side, I mean, just to elaborate the question uh -huh. a little bit more. Um, 
I could right. project something as curating for culture, and I could project it as Ishita as the principal investigator on a project. Absolutely. Um, so, and there is really no loss because I can still put curating for culture, let's say dot com, as the website link for a certain project. So, totally. in terms of entry or the platform, what it offers apart from the logo, is there something more that the platform could start offering, which makes mm -hmm. which helps to see it as an institutional. So what I'm trying to think is, can multiple authors build an institutional archive? Because that would be one important requirement when we were building SEPT archive. Right. Uh, that no, absolutely. Two different kinds of users were, end, uh, sorry, end users. No, uh, right. back end users were required. Right. No, absolutely. I think this is what we were discussing a while back as well, where, uh, um, where I was, where um, I sort of mentioned that one, one of the ways is since there are several um several people who are contributing to it instead of doing it through one account everybody there could be several users um okay. under an institution so that's what we are building towards okay so it will eventually yeah. happen absolutely that's the concept in place and now we're building towards it okay and so that will be another sort of let's say maybe impetus or um like a yeah i mean that's another reason why one would want to create an institutional archive over a personal archive because it um, allows for several archivists or several individuals to jointly contribute to that one group. Right. Yes. And um, I mean, we can discuss this further, but once we once that happens, it would also help if um, certain kind of decisions were subject to uh, approval within team members. So certain sort of I don't mean role assignment in terms of hierarchies, but also clarifications or communications between team members. And again, I'm really over here thinking of communities coming together, community members coming together to use right. the institutional one. Um, yes. um, I can think of the Humpy project, for example. And if mm -hmm. we, because this is a, pro, a, a platform easier for, let's say, our com community partners in Humpy to right. start engaging with. And they want to start uploading things, and they're writing something in English, and they want us to look at it. But then it's not uh, really um, uh, authoritative in that sense, or a decision, right. but a right. uh, cohesive decision making. Right. Um, right. No. Also, so right as you rightly mentioned, it need not be a hierarchical thing. But let's say it is, or maybe you're assigning certain roles to certain people. Hmm. So there is a concept out there which is called uh role-based access control or yes. RBAC. right so um that is so as soon as we begin implementing the multiple users per institution concept that's when um RBAC automatically sinks into the whole picture so those are things that we will bring into into play okay also um i think Aparna Shvetal, uh, right Aparna has a hand raised ah, and then Shvetal's question yes also, if Aparna is trying to access this um, yeah. on the phone. Yeah, is it a good time to ask a quick question? Or should I ask later? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. So I want to ask you uh, also is um, what I want to ask you was that, yeah, so essentially some of us could be individuals, but we may also um, run an institution. And we may want to route our archival project through the institution instead of our personal name, maybe, or both. So is that 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 could be an option also, right? Absolutely. That that is. I mean, that's a very logical option, and um, uh, we hope to have you do it sometime in the near future, where you're, you're you're an individual, but you're also a part of the institution. But just because you're part you're part of an institution, that doesn't mean that uh, you don't. Um, necessarily go about creating Sorry. your own personal archives right so that fair point that you bring up yes it, right okay and also like suppose if, if we want to invite um like the uh, uh, members of the public to um to um to lekha then would it be through the lekha link uh would we be given a separate kind of a like a page or a how does that work so Right. So um, actually, if I share my screen, I can show you where you can go to sort of uh, find the link that you have to share. 
Okay, great. I'll just quickly share my page. All right, thank you. Sure. Um, are you able to view my screen? Uh, yes, 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 I can. Right. So, okay. So let's say um, you're in your dashboard and you've added a bunch of work, right? So if you want to share a link to the entire archive and not just a specific piece, you, all you have to do is click on go to archive and the link that you see on top now, which is for, in my case, that's lekha.cc slash artist slash arco, whatever is my username. So once you copy that link and share it with people, they automatically, whenever they visit, they will land up on this page where uh, they will find all the work that I've put up and things like that. So that's a public public facing link, assuming your link, uh, assuming your archive is private. Great. So this is uh, the link that you share. OK, nice. Thank you so yeah. much. And, uh, right. So there won't sure. be any problem finding it. Like they wouldn't have to sift through uh, other, you know, other artists and then arrive at it and all. It would be like a direct link. It, this is a direct link. Yes, they don't have to oh. go through. They don't have to first go to lekha.cc and then search for it because mm -hmm. you as a creator, for example, or right. an archivist will have access to this link because you're the one who has created it. Correct. So now all you have to do is share this. Mm -hmm. And so this is for the entire archive. But let's say Great. you only want to share uh, the link to a specific work for mm -hmm. whatever reason. Perhaps. Yeah. So then you click on the work in your dashboard or wherever mm. your archive. Yeah. And then the link that gets generated is the link to that specific work. I see. OK. So that's slash artist slash the username and then whatever the name of the work is. All and, right. and if they want to discover more of your work, all they have mm -hmm. to do is click on, in my case, it's Orco Propose Archive. So when they mm -hmm. click on it, they yeah. go back to my entire archive. I see. Great. And uh, yeah. you have both audio, video, um, yes, all, all of so that. we support audio, video, PDF, mm -hmm. um, um, and uh, all forms of static images, so JPG, um, PNGs, and all of that, yes. Mm. But um, certain file formats like .txt or GIFs, for example, mm -hmm. are something that we are yet to support, but uh, you okay. could expect support for that. Yeah. Oh, great. That's awesome. And uh, I don't know whether you, you covered this already. Uh, in case I mm -hmm. missed it, uh, apologies for that, which is, um, uh, what about the commercials? Uh, uh, like, the, you know, in terms of rentals or, uh, you know, use of your space, hosting, all of that? So at this point, it's all free. Uh, we are not okay. charging for, Lekha isn't charging uh, for storage or for creating an account, be it okay. an institution or an artist. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. uh, but eventually, I mean, right, we still haven't thought about that eventuality yet, but right. maybe there might be a point where to yeah. keep the project running. Yeah. It might be a one-time payment or a, or a subscription-based model, but okay. that really also depends on our conversations with people who are using it and right. how they and how they sort of value this, yeah. um, value whatever Lekha is trying to offer. Correct. And so once, um, once we sort of have those conversations, with a lot mm. more of our users, uh, yeah. I think uh, we'll be at a point to define uh, what Lekha might look like commercially. Oh, great. Yeah, fair enough. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sure. I think we can take up Shweta's question. Um, I tried, uh, sorry, um, is it possible right. to communicate to the viewers of the archive on the platform, leave messages or chat? Um, sorry, this is this. All right. Um, no, so there isn't a messaging feature on this platform yet. But I believe um, it does have potential to be a feature for sure. But right now, uh, you cannot leave messages in the form of a message or a chat, in the traditional form of a message or a chat. But if you so wish, again, you can populate your description metadata. Um, uh, to, to facilitate a conversation, I guess. But no, again, that won't be a conversation, but it will be more from an archivist standpoint where you're making some, you're making points, let's say. But I guess conversation is something that we need to work on. Yeah, I was, Thank you for yeah, that question. I was more thinking Great. like, you know, if you share this link with somebody and then somebody is right. thinking, instead of then going to an email and then sending out, right. if they can leave comments, if not at every picture or everything, but at least with a series or at the end of the archive, if there is a place or there's a chat box where they can keep 
jotting down right. points or even you know something like that because I, no, absolutely then we kind of i mean have the community uh, interacting right there you know and um, right no that, that's actually a great point or especially mm. when we think from a community standpoint as ishita also mentioned earlier uh, right i think that's a that'll be your value add thank you for sure thank you and then there is a question from shishti um about uh, meta tags uh, is that correct yeah I try is there an option to add meta tags for the artworks uh so when they say meta tags um in what sense shishti um so i mean like i when i was using the um, um just the individual account and mm -hmm. i added a project under one of the folders yes um, i would want to tag like i would want to talk about whether this is related to climate or this is related to gender so right. that it can search if i want to search particular theme mm -hmm. i'm able to get different kind of uh, artworks related to that theme right so at this point um, that isn't a feature that's available okay uh, so you could but that doesn't mean that you can't populate your information with these tags but it's not visible in the form that i think you're looking for which is tags and searchability through tags yes. that's something that will be there in the future but not at this point okay so even if i add a new descriptor and like you know so you tag. could yes so you could no, precisely so you could create a new descriptor called tags okay. and then in the value for that descriptor um you add those tags as maybe hashtags separated by commas or however you deem fit so we can use the same format of like separating commas for absolutely it. yes you can at this point and then um from an implementation standpoint what we could do is then convert those convert those tags in the future when you're supporting tags and searching through tags okay so i think um one way to go about it is as you rightly mentioned now okay okay yeah thank you sure yeah so we are we are building the archive right now right huh. yes so yeah i just run observation like i noted that you know when you're putting an image and you have to put a date um so sometimes you don't have the exact date of an image right and you would like the option of you know late 1950s or you know something like that instead of putting like a date over there ah yes or being able to say not available or absolutely mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah because that's a very given thing for an archive to have so many things as not available or not known at this moment and then you can add it later fair point yes absolutely hi arku um, could you please repeat what you mentioned uh, on ocr so i had just uh, suggested that that's something that usually helps archives um especially the ones which are built so much on either the semantics or linguistic uh, inquiry so i was suggesting that eventually would these be also um, would the archive also have the ocr feature embedded in it so which mm -hmm. means that if i if i have even not mentioned the word um, museum in the tags but it's there in the article and if somebody comes and searches for the word museum Mm -hmm. then that means the ocr tool uh, reads into the documents and pulls it out and shows it as a search result and that's something that really helps because then it reduces a lot of pressure mm -hmm. on um, archivists not to say that we don't do the metadata and the keyword mapping thoroughly but we still can't cover it all mm -hmm. and that is why the user has the benefit that if you search for words which the archives has not highlighted um the the documents or the archive still search come up but it only works in specific languages no like english oh yeah it that those with... questions yes of course yeah. we are still right now uh working with the handicap that most of these things are going to work only for english mm -hmm. um so even when tonisha highlighted uh, questions of linguistic uh, multilingual necessities i was thinking because that's what we're trying with some other archiving projects where metadata also starts allowing more languages to come in not just um the description or not just the information about uh, and those becoming search, uh, searchable mm -hmm. i think these are things which we will all together hopefully fight and address and resolve in another few years 
So we at IIT Delhi are developing uh, an OCR tool for reading Urdu and probably Hindi too. And we have reached 92% of accuracy. It's, uh, it's, it's a project of humanities department collaboration with other, um, I don't know which department is, this exactly is, but uh, we always work in collaboration with the BTEC students. So yeah. That's fantastic. Really good to know that, yeah. I think in the registration bit, Arko, one other thing which would really be useful is um, a space to mention uh, terms of usage. Because that's yeah. something that we start with every archiving project when we're guiding them that you're setting your intentions for two reasons. Of course, it helps you guide the arch information architecture. But right. the second reason is so that you can draw out your policies of usage and um, even data collection and ethics and so on and so forth. Absolutely. So whether you have two parts, which is um, both the charter and the uh, terms and policies of uh, terms and conditions of usage, or mm -hmm. at least have one larger space where everything can be mentioned. Absolutely. But each archive will have its own. And that's something that pops up when um, I visit an archive. So right. if I click on the link which uh, Apana has created for her archive, that's the first thing that could pop up for me to know, OK, here are the terms and conditions. And then Absolutely. one starts engaging with the archive. No, that's very true. Sure. I think uh, that, we, we, yes, I've made a note of it. Uh, we will incorporate. Thank you. Hi. Um, Rishita, could you tell me the difference between a, a classification and medium or something like a photography archive, let's say? Um, so, Arko, do you want to take that first because you all might have a different logic to it? Oh, I was about to say maybe Ishida has, uh, you have more bandwidth to answer that? Okay, sure. So, um, one second. So, I mean, whether you call it classification in this case, which the platform does, um, the different types. So, in case um, you want to do without a sub series, you want to just create, let's say, um, year-wise uh, classification for your readers. So one classification itself could take that as an entry. I think the benefit of that is you could all actually have longer phrases or you could have multiple classifications. So you want to put the certain kind of time periods, you want to put, um, let's say, authorship also as classification or something. So that right now, at least for Lekha, I can see that that's becoming a, um, a space for um, defining architecture of your archive, which necessarily doesn't need to be clickable, or which doesn't need to be something that's evident in the curation, two ways of putting it. Whereas um, all the other categories like medium, material, um, you want to go into uh, type. So these, you could introduce them to start identifying the tangible qualities of your archive. So for photography, what we differentiate between is whether it's a digital photography or analog one, we want to differentiate between black and white and color. Um, in medium, if you're doing xenotype versus um, um, role development versus, again, digital will remain digital production. Um, similarly, you would focus on size of your photographs. So I think, and of course, it, both in print and in digital, if your sizes are different, so those will become your uh, tangible met metadata for photography, but also most of the artworks. Right, right. That makes sense. That makes cool. sense. Uh, just to confirm, it's sort of like um, medium would have uh, medium and dimensions. All of these would be about the artwork itself, and let's say classification would be how we're curating all of these artworks. Yes, so that's a good way to put it. So classification you could use to explain subject content of your archive right right so the, it, that's why at, at lekha's level classification is right now becoming a very open category for somebody to interpret right. now let's say another archive and shwetal is building it quite by the content itself then she might use classification to actually just mention five things about a video clip so the metadata, which otherwise could be the metadata of a video clip, but she doesn't want that to be the focus of the archive. That could become a part of the classification that these are um, 8 mm or 10 mm uh, reels or whatever. And those are going up in classification. Right. Yeah. Okay. Because it's important to show, but it's not important to make it evident. 
sorry aku were you saying something no no all of that made a lot of sense thanks for that so while i am putting the thing up in the uh, add and edit metadata there is something called location created what does that mean uh, what do i need to put in over there mm. so let's say for example maybe you were a, for example if you're a visiting artist or a, or an artist in residence at a lab in a different place um let's say maybe at a school a school in mysore maybe mm. so if you'd like to mention that as part of your metadata so the location would then be um karnataka mysore okay in that okay. sense yeah okay. thank you yeah so i think one other thing which i would highlight while building this uh, and using the platform <clears throat> two things which are big, which i think we all must know i'm just reiterating it your conceptual take on your archive is still going to be evident important um, not evident uh, essential and important because what's happening is for example the first entry that i'm trying to make and when it asks me medium i am calling it photography because that's the difference that i want to draw in that category but let's say i want to use a certain medium i'm and immediately moving on to architectural archiving if i want to highlight that the medium is a drawn hand drawn drawing versus a digital drawing so i am creating this using the same category which is provided by the platform but using it differently for two different sections right um so conceptually clarifying your own logic of your archive and hence what it will be called is going to be crucial to using any kind of a platform wherever it's possible to customize it you can rename it if it's not possible you'll be using the same name that a platform gives you and entering in so only when your reader goes through five different images they will know how you are interpreting the word medium from one archive to the other um this is to say that sanya uh, while csv upload uh, might not be required and lekha has designed differently you will still need some form of record sheet building tool which is where you will try out these exercises so for me excel sheet um, really becomes csv much later in 6 8 months of a project but initially what it does is it allows this breaking up of information it's it's this tool where i can literally deconstruct an archiving project and what we continuously do is we keep changing the names of the field on the top ki ye sahi hai ki ye sahi hai which one describes the entry better and that's what a uh, excel sheet really starts doing whichever tool so we still have to discover more tools in that direction but you would need some such tool which breaks open the information and then what we do is on the subsidiary excel uh, sh uh, sub uh, sheets we start putting in our own definitions or clarifications if we obviously need to create a drop down menu for bulk uh, archiving then obviously the excel formula allows us to create those bulk entries so making the sheets becomes much easier because when you're working with bulk data i think you you look for both clarity on definitions so that whatever we've decided when the two other rs might pick it up they are less confused and second is uh, giving them this uh, help of uh, saved entries or memory so i think that would still be required for any platform and right now i'm thinking that if even here you could just copy paste right so even if it's not a csv upload you could use any such tool where you break open the data and you're not writing but you are quickly pulling it once you have decided how it goes then uh, data entry and upload is more of copy paste a little more mechanical and fast so i have created the archive if anyone wants to have a look but i don't find the option to add um the keywords is there an option to add the keywords which you mentioned earlier so uh when when you say keywords so what you can do is uh when you're adding the work mm. you can you can say add you can add a custom descriptor and call it keywords or tags and then you add whatever keywords you have to separating them with a comma maybe okay yeah where is it again the description no so you when you so i'm assuming you've already created a piece of work so when you click on edit for that mm -hmm. work again and on that model or that pop up that you mm -hmm. see uh if you scroll to the bottom you'll see cu add yeah. custom descriptor okay there'll be a black button i think right mm -hmm. now so you click on that and okay. then um 
Uh, you type in either keywords your tags, and mm. then after that, in the next field, you type in all the keywords you have mm, and okay. separate them with commas, maybe. Yeah. Up to you. Yeah. I think the citation feature is quite quite uh, amazing because I think uh, it just <clears throat> makes it easier for a user, but also uh, makes sure that there is no reason why they should not cite when they use people's work. Right. And also because I mean, uh, it becomes also a matter matter of ethics if you mm. will, because you're using someone else's work. Yeah. Maybe I mean, even if you're referencing it, it is always good to give credit where it's due. And so, yeah, that's what I mean, right? So yeah. a lot of people, students would turn back and say, "Oh, but I didn't know how to use something from an archive yeah, yeah, and yeah. reference it." So it's and I and I know that they're right in a way because our standards don't necessarily address something as archives. So right. then they're looking for it in MLA or in uh, the Chicago style. Mm. They don't understand that a newspaper cutting from an archive or a photograph is a photograph or a newspaper. So when right. you don't get a chance to clarify this, and especially when I'm sitting in the jury, it's too late to clarify. That time it helps if they have gone through platforms where it's where it's mm -hmm. given. And I think a lot of resource platforms are doing it now. Yes. Where they put the link out there so it's easier to reference. Mm -hmm. For sure. Uh, where is this uh, feature of citation? Where does that come? It comes up automatically. That's what. Um, once you enter in all the data, huh. it picks all the fields. If you have not been able to write something as not available, that will hopefully come up there. And then everything gets generated on your review, okay. uh, on your okay. public view. So basically, you will find that after you've added a piece of work. And when you click on that work to go check it out, um, citation is another field along with the rest of the metadata. It okay. appears towards the end of the work. So I think uh, what I'm seeing now, I'm just going to share my screen. Mm -hmm. And that's something I was uh, sort of worried about. And then um, when everyone's ready, Sanya, we'll start with yours. So I'm just right now using this time to clarify. <clears throat> so <clears throat> sorry. So while I understand now this is very useful, um, I'm just worried about the fact that I can save an image. And I can even enlarge it and save it. So, right. so that, that is a matter of concern. Yeah, well. so okay. that's okay. a bit of a concern. Not so much, let's say, for work that belongs to me. Because there right. I have rights. But when right. you're building archives, you're usually working with people. Who, you're working with people's IP. Yes. Other people's IP. And that time, this becomes a bit tricky that somebody can save it. Absolutely. Um, right. So, I said, OK, fair point. Yes. Got it. So it's also OK if they take a screenshot. <clears throat> but if we can uh, lock the save as button, that okay. would be just fair. Because what as archive build, as, a, as an archivist, what I've understood is mm -hmm. your um, donors or your co-contributors are only worried up to the point that you have taken the best steps possible to safeguard the material. So right. if this is a platform that I'm choosing as an archivist of a certain community or a certain family, I'm mm -hmm. ensuring them that there are certain lock-ins. After Absolutely. the point, yes, everybody needs to be a little flexible with the idea that you're putting it on public domain and a lot can happen with it. Yes. No, uh, but absolutely. So essentially, screenshotting and save as mm -hmm. is something that uh, we, we should disable. Yeah. Right. Got it. Makes sense. And on the other end, uh, to the archivist, what I would suggest is <clears throat> when you know that these are the kind of things in, in the platform that you choose, mm. you can go with images which are low resolution. So yes. what I have right now uploaded is a high resolution image. Mm -hmm. um, you can choose to upload images which are low resolution. So <clears throat> the misuse of it is controlled. I cannot blow up that image and do much with it. The second thing which you can do is uh, start using certain kinds of non-intrusive watermarks. The only reason I'm emphasizing on the word non-intrusive is that your purpose of making data or information available is not defied by your own second decision. Because that's what also puts off a lot of readers. That you have created a platform which is accessible. And then if I can't read the lines in a drawing by putting a watermark, which is very imposing, then what's the point? So you work with watermarks um, very intelligently or smartly. And there are tutorials about how you watermark things for copyrights and so on and so forth. So you choose the right space the way Getty does it. So you cannot really cut it out without losing the meaning of a of a photograph or of any object. 
So you could try those things and then also leave it a little bit to people's own ethics. But at least your co-contributors would be satisfied that, OK, you are doing all that's necessary. And I think the other thing which Arko, I wanted to highlight um, is uh, because you have done, which is very important, the authors and creators category separately. Yes. Um, I would suggest that rights is mm -hmm. something that should become a given category rather than as I just created it, by the way, right now. Right. Because again, as I said, that's something that's very critical. Mm -hmm. But um, because it's an archive um, and an archiving platform, would mm -hmm. would the team want to emphasize that clarity on rights is very important? Right. Mm -hmm. Unlike um, <clears throat> unlike um, Amazon, mm -hmm. because it's a purchase platform. But right. this is a platform where it's about information and there's a possibility that it's somebody else's information. And mm -hmm. I am making it available, but it's not available for public use. So I've put right. this here um, right in front of it. So the, you, there's the onus is also on the reader. So Absolutely. even if this lock-in was not there to save an image, they know that they should be careful about it. They can still use the citation, because in a research paper, I can still say that in the image shown in uh, Ishita's archive, it is quite evident. Right. I'm sorry, but I think we missed out you might have missed out on some of the things you might have said a little earlier because you were frozen. OK. But we got, I think, uh, the last thing we heard was uh, about the rights and making it, uh, I mean, just putting it out there loud and bold. So it appeals oh, okay. to people's better con the people's better conscience. So I basically then give an example, uh, which is to say that the citation still mm -hmm. makes it clear that they can make a reference of it in a research paper. Right. Just to say, having seen this image in or image number 001 in uh, Ishita's archive, it is very clear that this and this happened. Right. So you can still refer to it, mm -hmm. but they should not use the image without permission. And that right. brought me to the third point and the last point is how do I then request special permission? So some contact detail of the archives or the archivist. Because right. if I don't mention the website for curatingforculture.com, then yes. they don't know how to get in touch. And also that becomes a two-step process. Right. Uh, this is a generation which doesn't want to click further if we don't have to. Right. So could it be that on the same page, there's always a possibility to know whom do I request? Or maybe a request um, intimation goes directly from a button right. to my email that uh, mm -hmm. Nishita was interested in this image. And I can reach out to her. No, absolutely. I think. Um... It should also be a part of every piece of work because it could yes. be specific to a very specific bit of content. So yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Made a note. Nishita. Yeah. Um, so I've been uh, uploading the images, and I just realized that I can add a caption for each image. Mm -hmm. so after uploading it, uh, if I go back to previous images that have already been uploaded, I don't think. Mm -hmm. To edit the caption, you're unable to edit the caption for each. Right. Right. Is that something that uh, is possible? Uh, not at this point. Okay. Uh, but yes, that is something that is important. To point out. Cool. Um, I think another thing is, um, I think because of the type of project that I have, um, I think it's important to sh show all the images up front rather than click through them one by one. Just to be able to see the transition, um, Got it. maybe that might also be interesting. Mm -hmm. Also, um, let's say. So, are you referring to? Okay, so right now, are you putting up all the images as part of one work? I'm guessing that's what you're doing. Okay, but mm -hmm. ideally, you'd also want to be able to see them all together. Right. Um, I can next to each other. Um, yeah. Sure. Go ahead. So um, I guess with this uh, archive, mm -hmm. I would like to see how the sky changes over time. Right. All together and um, up front, maybe. I don't well, know if it's a really um, like a general use case, but just mm -hmm. for this particular project, maybe um, that might be interesting to see. Right. No, makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, I mean, right now, if um, somebody up let's say you had uploaded these as separate pieces 
which logically doesn't make sense. But I mean, it makes sense to group them all together under one work. Um, right. But if someone was to not do that, but upload them as separate pieces. So when you, when someone visits the archive, you would, you would be able to see them all next to each other. Uh, OK. Yeah. Yes. Sure. No, but perhaps this is one use case that we can think about designing for, where a clear transition is visible if the archivist wants to make it, uh, make it visible and evident mm -hmm. um, to the viewer. But thank you for that, yes. Sure, thanks. Yeah, I think we can move to everyone showing what they have been able to try. Um, Sanya, do you want to start? And then we, whoever has tried can follow you. Um, what should I show? <laughs> Share the screen, uh, your link, your platform, which you created right now on Lekha. You can also compare the two cases, and we all could discuss that as well, what you felt and what you did. OK. So this is the archive that I built. Right. And um, so I did not add much of the details right now because they're still lacking. Uh, these are the scanned images, which I had in my uh, documents folder. So hmm. so did you upload a PDF or images? <laughs> images? I actually scanned in the form of a PDF, but then I converted because I used it. Um, I had to use it in some other archive, which I shared. OK. So, so I converted the PDFs into uh, JPGs. Where do I go next? Achha. It doesn't go uh, like a series of images. I have to click on it separately. You could, um, uh, no, you could try using the left and right buttons. Oh, the okay. keyboard keys, sorry, keys. No, it's not working actually. Oh no. Okay, then I guess uh, <laughs> you'll have to click through them individually. Okay. What if I add the um, what was that custom description thing and then I add the keywords? Where will they appear? At the bottom. At the bottom. Here, at scroll. the bottom. Okay. So right, right now. The so right now, the descriptors are author and place created. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's say you had added a custom descriptor of tags or keywords. Mm -hmm. uh, they would appear here under okay. place created. Yeah. All right. Yes. I love it that the citation appears just here. Which format is it? Uh, I don't know. Is this the? Uh, I think, I think yeah, it's I think Chicago. So. If I'm correct, it's Chicago. OK. But yeah, I think mentioning that Arco at the side would help as well. Yeah, no, these are great uh, points. citation uh -huh. is coming up. So yes. if it's Chicago or it's MLA, but if that can become the title of that category. And mm -hmm. not just that, let's say uh, perhaps if we generate the citation in multiple such formats, because depending uh -huh. on how you're using it or how, Where let's say, to... yeah, maybe for a certain publication, they only accept a certain format. So yeah, we can. You know, shift between um, uh, the more um, uh, popular uh, citation formats. Yes, that's yeah. something we should. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is the other one. This is this is the GitHub repository which I um, created, and and based on this, the archive is created. So this is the metadata file which I had to edit. Hmm. Metadata.csv. Uh, so I think it might be clearer things. if you showed the front end. Yeah. First. Right. And then um, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. So this is the archive. This is the web page. And here you can see the time span, the subject, the keywords which I um which, which I mentioned here and the locations. One problem is that I am not able to get the images of um, which I uploaded here. So it has everything except except the images. 
and here uh, is the CSV files which, which you can download and you can download it in many formats. And here's the background. So while uh, building this, I had to edit the metadata file, which was um, a little bit complicated for me as a humanist because I do not know how to do that. And this is all the sample data, which I just entered like that. So I think that uh, this Lekha platform is much easier than this one because I had to dedicate a lot of time, work, and, and I had to ask a lot of many people uh, to help me in this. But this is um, quite comprehensive and I can do it on my own and I'm sure anybody can do it on their own. Right. Nice to know that. Anyone else uh, who's tried and wants to take it on? So Sony and Shwedal are presenting. After that, um, anyone else, Nijum, Gita Ji, or Aparna, if you are, just put it in the chat so we'll time it accordingly. So that's me. Uh, I logged in, so this was the about part. I I added one item, <laughs> one category or one classification, which is translation. And I added one book uh, into this category or this classification. And uh, this is the item. Once you click on the item, you go to the book, which is this. You get to see all the details. This is the title of the book. Uh, I am the one who added it. It's a paperback. Here is a note description. This is the wonderful thing I'm, you know, discovering about each and every uh, work. So somewhere there is morality police writing about, uh, you know, how this is bad or that is bad. Somewhere it is, uh, you know, a very rare translation I'm discovering. So all of these notes are becoming, you know, very fun thing for me to write. And uh, uh, this is how I populated the other uh, categories. So I'll add it to a translation. He's the author, Hanuman Prasad Podar. The translation or the book itself was created in Bombay. <laughs> the translator is uh, Khatri. These are the tags. This is what I added on my own. I, I Translator was also a category that I added on my own and added his name. And uh, these are the tags that I gave to it. Oh, this is very interesting. Um, so sorry, I'm just asking a question right away before you can ask. Um, why didn't Hanuman Prasad Podar come, Arko? Because I noticed in mine, uh, what was the author that came in the citation, but here it is mm -hmm. not coming in. Is there yeah, a reason? here the creator is coming. Ah, right. So instead right. of the author has to come, right? Right, that makes sense in the um, citation. Uh, citation, yes. And the yeah, other thing is, uh, can we include um, the new categories in the citation? Because in normal citation, translator will also be mentioned. So can those right. kinds of customization be also weaved in, especially with a project like this, where right, right, it's right. all about books, and then the uh, archivist can reach out to you, and that could be corrected or clarified. No, absolutely. I think uh, that's something that's oh, quite important. The other thing is, Ishika, another way to uh, think about it is you are citing the archivist's work. So the citation itself needs to be modified, not from the point of view of uh, the book. Hmm. It's like the bibliographical detail should be within the archival detail. Uh, okay. Two ways. One is you cite the book. Mm -hmm. then, that, that, then the platform does not matter or the archivist does not matter. Right, the right. Other is it. This is a part of this archivist's work, and therefore the yeah, archivist's website matters. Fantastic. Here. Yeah. So here you, it should be citing the archivist's work, under which bibliographic details come in. Um, yes. In in either cases, this entire thing will need to be modified. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, what you would do with something like um, uh, archiving or citing a researcher's work. So if I have read about um, Minute De Silva in Anuradha Siddiqui's paper, 
So if I'm quoting something that Minet said, I would still have to first refer to uh, Anuradha's paper because that's the first uh, source. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. Then even if you do not consider uh, this researcher's thing, it's okay as long as you went back to the original work. No, no, that's what I'm saying. So I didn't huh. go back to the original work. That's why I'm saying this. Huh. So you so will have to say quoted in. Huh. You'll have to say quoted in and then yeah. uh, cite the secondary resource that you found. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. So why we do that with researchers' uh, work where hmm. you can't accept the original, then that same thing applies to an archivist platform also yeah sorry so i just quickly came no. up with this because citation no, help. Help. go help. ahead anyone else alko what do you think i think these are some fantastic points that are coming up and you, and you only come up with them when you face them while you're building it so this yes. is i know the, the whole thing um conceptually ethically, logically makes a lot of sense. Mm. So um, these are great points. Thank you. And other thing I could highlight over here for Nishita is this uh, medium and classification, which I was mentioning. Because right. here, uh, Sony has taken medium as paperback. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's a book archiving project. Yes. Yeah. For right. her, the first clarification is going to be whether it's a hard book, hardbound, or a paperback, or um, whereas somebody else who has looked at books as one of the archives mm. right. to first clarify books versus photographs versus audio clips in that same category. Right. So this so is what. Also... Sorry, go ahead. No, that's it. This is what's oh, going okay. to happen. I'm saying. Right. No, so we've also been thinking about um, whether we should create a few presets for a few different types of industries, let's say, or mm. types of archives you know like maybe a book archive or maybe a photography archive are there certain metadata presets that mm. could make more sense uh, to a specific type of archive you know so maybe you know how uh, so then they become templates of some sort which you can add to or remove from mm. because they are descriptors at the end of the day uh, but maybe i don't know if that might be help more helpful in clarifying certain such um, queries and questions so at this point, because it's a, it's really and from you talking from the top of our heads, right. I think there are pros and cons to both. Because what I was appreciating right now is the fact that it's not so preset. Precisely. So there is a lot of room for interpretation, right. which means that even a photography archive uh -huh. can have a new way of approaching the archive. Right. Rather than fall into the presets. Having said that, yes, because the platform's interest is to enable. So something like Canva, right, where mm. I can use a template or I can go in fresh and make my own thing. Absolutely. If that happens after I select artist or individual, right? Uh, sorry, artist or institution. In um, mm. That and or the question is, should it happen at that stage itself? So instead of saying artist or institution, mm -hmm. could it be that the type of archives is the choice that one makes, and whether it's an artist archive or an institutional archive? Could there be a community-based approach to entering into the archive? Because right. right now, conceptually, if that's the only difference that's needed, and that's what we are all able to identify, that one will have single user and one will have three users. I don't know if that really needs to be a separate entry. So rather than at that stage itself, could it be more types of archives? Absolutely. And the user bit is something that just is one of the tools which I can work with when I'm defining other uh, details of the archive that, okay, I want to make it open to two more people right. um, and just give their email addresses and and measure their um, responsibility uh, into the right. platform. So essentially, yeah, so that shouldn't become a differentiating factor. There could be other ways of thinking about these differentiating factors. Yeah, but those could be archives itself. Instead right. of it being authorship, it could be Absolutely. archives itself, which is the starting point. No, for sure, yes, mm -hmm. interesting. Shweta? So I don't have like an image for the, the research. So I've just used the poster of the film. And this is the page where you hit the archive. It's called Full Circle. And then you go to the images that are uploaded. Then there's music. I kind of hit a block when I was 
uh, uploading music because uh, some of them are WAV files and they will not. So I was wondering if it's possible to just embed a link um, and I kind of upload it on YouTube and it's still there on the archives. Uh, similarly, also for videos, because I think I can have a YouTube channel and then that gets connected over here. I don't know. Mm -hmm. so, because um, my overall data is definitely way above. I mean, it's like slightly less than one TB is what I have right now. So, right. because it's also a lot of uh, audiovisual, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, to sort of address the part about links, huh. you can still um, paste your links in the description, right? Huh. But I feel like it makes more. I mean, so when you think about links, hmm. you're thinking about the term links and not hmm. about pasting it within a description box, let's say. Hmm. So maybe hmm. that's something that we uh, that we revisit as a platform. Yeah. yeah. But yes, got because it. see, when you are in music, I may mm -hmm. be able to upload some small files over there, mm -hmm. yes. which you can access directly. Right. But if it's like a big file, then I feel it's better if it's like in the same format and you know it's just a click. And it goes somewhere, and you hear it rather than going into the description. Um, got it. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. But I think I I still need to figure out all this um, in the sense like uh, where am I? So suppose uh, I'm opening one image. Uh, Ishita, maybe you can tell me whether what I'm filling up and how what is coming up. How does that look? As in. Because it's also this is the first time I'm putting up information like this to see how it comes across. Right. I mean, I would say that if we can flood uh, and sort of build the volume on this platform hmm. uh, over the over the next week or so, and then share links with each other hmm. uh, to keep the discussion running on um, email, if that's hmm. okay. Because yeah. I think the better way to also comment on the documentation and what the archive starts looking will make sense if there is a few more things. So I can ask, why right. did you write this in a photograph but not in an audio clip? Or huh. um, how are they connecting with each other? So I am right. right now waiting to see how this workshop can build into a self-driven exercise for at least a week. I'm, even if you don't want to build eventually a digital archive, which is fine. But I think it addresses a lot of questions about the project itself. Hmm. Okay. Right now, it all looks very fascinating to me. I'm like, wow, that's the immediate reaction. But I, I know what your question is. And we could take a call on it once we see a little more material. Yeah. Um, OK. So I think with that, we have just ended on time. We, I'm sure we all will have more questions. And I think uh, we'll collate those, Arco, and then send them to you. Yes, please. Or yes, um, yes. We'll, make, we'll start an email thread. But, uh, because these are just very interesting conversations, apart from feature requests and whatnot. Right. I mean, some of these questions, they lead to so many bigger questions. And that's, that's fantastic, actually. True. Yes. And, um, and even if one of us is right now taking this forward, like using Lekha and creating their database, I think yeah. that itself will be a much stronger um, constructive collaboration to right. watch it for. Also, like I'd like to um, sort of reiterate the point that let's say um, you're facing maybe image size constraints or certain other such constraints, do reach out to us. Maybe if, if they're reaching out via you, Ishita, you could forward those emails. And we'll see what we can do to accommodate those. Right. on a one-on-one -on -one basis um, so that they can continue to build on Lekha if they so choose. Right. So I was just going to request or ask your permission that I'll just start an email thread mm -hmm. uh, marking you into it and all sure. the participants of this workshop. Yes. Um, so they can directly write or reply to all because then it reduces a lot of effort. Absolutely. Um, we all also learn from somebody else's question. You respond and then totally. we all grow uh, together as well as grow this platform together. Sure, sure. No, that that totally works. Actually, that'd be great. Yes, that works. Great. And I think one other thing which I would want to clarify, which I think will also come through in the com next two sessions, mm -hmm. is the fact that this is uh, we're looking for simpler, simplified options. But 
um, if you do get involved with coding and a developer, web developer, even at the le level of Lekha or independently, you can imagine more forms to your archives. So I think there's merit again in both systems. The fact one, which is a form based system, which allows you to just click upload um, and that helps at a certain stage, definitely. And then you can always imagine or hope that you'll find more funding and you'll take this platform or your archive and then recurate it in terms of um, working with developers and coding. This is to say, coming to the first question, earlier question which I'd asked, when you think of whether it's an exhibiting form, exhibition form, or of a another form which is more storytelling or interactive or performative, that's all possible on the web. And you just need to get in touch with the backend team and see the magic of it. So just want to leave us with more potential or more possibilities to think about. No, absolutely. And if someone is um, interested in checking out um, what their work, I mean, what some a part of their work would look like in 3D, mm. it's totally possible for us to do that for you. So oh. again, I think on that email thread, they can just put in a request. Okay. And we can figure it out. So we'd have um, so essentially that's gallery.lekha.cc right now, where you can see the two 3D exhibitions. Um, and if people are willing to add to it, do reach out for sure. Fantastic. All right. Thank you so much, Arko, for spending this this morning with us and taking us through this platform. I'm sure we are all going to explore me. a lot more. Mm -hmm. I'm loving. I'm loving all the points that have come out of this. So yeah, I, I know. It sort of did become a little bit of a feedback session to Lekha. <laughs> I mean, I don't mind <laughs> being a, being someone who's associated with Lekha and building it. So that was right. good. And yes. even if you come back to us with clarities on what is not going to happen or why, I think there also we learn because for you all, it's about creating this platform rather than yeah. only addressing such individual needs because you're looking at a mass. Right. So we also want to be looped in. And if there's, yeah, all of us can be added to the newsletter or wherever, we can right. see how the platform's growing. Um, mm -hmm. That would be wonderful. Right, absolutely. Um, OK, so the ISRO does have a mailing list. If okay. if, if someone is so interested you know, in the newsletter that the ISRO sends out, um, you could visit this link, which I just pasted, which is essentially the isro.org. And if you scroll down to the bottom of that page, there's a newsletter that, that you can sign up for. OK. Yes. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think I'm getting those. So I didn't realize that that's where uh, Lekha is also getting. Uh, no, right. So while we are still building out all of this into Lekha, as in as the isro being like more parent organization, it has a few sort of logistics that are uh, that are already set up as opposed mm -hmm. to the ones that Lekha. So uh, feel free to join the newsletter if you so wish for further updates while we build Lekha. Fantastic. We'll do that. Thank you awesome. once again. I'll put an email thread uh, later in the evening. Absolutely. And to all the archivists, if you can keep working with the platform at least for a week, just for uh, the workshop to make a lot more sense to all of us, um, what worked, what didn't work, bring on the questions. Eventually, if you don't want to use the platform, feel free to take it all down. Uh, but in a week's time, if we all can just share where we are um, with each of the platforms, I think it will really help uh, in terms of learning from each other's experiences also. So yeah, I'm giving homework, uh, if that's what we want to call it. <laughs> um, but at your own convenience and uh, willingness, of course. Shrital, you wanted to say something? All right. See you all. And uh, let's target for 2 PM. So we at least start by 2.10. And uh, I'll let Ram also know. Arko will be coming back? No, he's not coming back, right? No, so, I'll be attending. Uh, you'll oh, be you attending? Oh. Yeah. OK. Right. Thank you. All right. See you. See you Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.